What's your new ranking of the games like now? Just out of curiosity, which is your least favourite? If I may ask, what are your three least favourite Trails games? Huh. I seem to be getting that question quite a lot lately. But I can't say it hasn't sparked my curiosity, and since there are ten games in the Canonical Trails series now, we're not including Nyuta here, it makes sense to compile them into a list. Now unlike many other ranking videos, putting the Trails games in a list of sequential quality is extremely difficult for me, because I love all of the games. It's not a case of best to worst, it's a case of best to least best. So there's going to be a lot of nitpicking here to separate them. Also, I'm aware that some people have not played the later titles, and I will tell you now that I will be spoiling the games in this video because a big factor in my personal enjoyment comes from, shocker, the story, and I want to talk about it. So if you see that ranking template for a game you haven't played yet, you can skip over it. Without further ado, these are the Trails games ranked from 10 to 1. Now let's get something straight first. Without Cold Steel 1, I would not be a Trails fan. I actually had Trails in the Sky first chapter on my computer six months before I even knew of Cold Steel 1's existence, and it didn't draw me in. I played it for an hour, put it down, and didn't go back. It was only when I bought the first game in the Erebonia arc that it super glued me to the seat and whispered in my ear, you will finish this game. And that eventually took me back to the Sky arc. So I owe Cold Steel 1 a massive debt for bringing me into the series, and no doubt it has a fair share of awesome moments. The attack on Trista, the reveal of Valimar, and some sprinkles of interconnectivity to the other titles thrown in for good measure. But as I've played more of the series and started to establish what aspects make the Trails game so special in the first place, at least from my perspective, I've come to the realisation that Cold Steel 1 doesn't really capitalise on those elements as much as the other titles. Make no mistake, this game is an introduction with a rigid structure. Do errands at school, fight your friends, go on a trip, rinse and repeat. Erebonia is a big place and we need the Grand Tour before we can start messing people up with Domination Tauros Radiant Lions. And for me, that formulaic approach is something I've never minded from Trails games. They are natural slow burners that are worth the payoff by the end. Cold Steel 1 is no exception there. My biggest issue, which I have talked about in a previous video, is in Class 7 themselves. I feel that the group is simply too large, and combine that with bonding events which handicap the natural growth of the members, the first Cold Steel title shoots itself in the foot on an aspect that Trails games are naturally strong in, that's being characterisation. If the game took a leaf out of Tokyo Xanadu EX Plus's book and put in side stories where the other members had events with each other, I've no doubt I'd be buying in more to the bonds that Class 7 members create with each other, but of course, a lot of the development of the group is done off screen as they are split up for their field studies, and we only see things from the perspective of Reen. Yes, there are fine moments between the likes of Eusis and Marcius plus the reconciliation of Fee and Laura, but there are also some characters who are just left to fend for themselves and pretty much get nothing. Cold Steel 1 is still a fantastic game, mind you, but it needed a few tweaks here and there. Moving on to the game that started it all, it's the seemingly innocent journey of two teenagers looking to become bracers. My number 9 spot is taken by Trails in the Sky first chapter. Like Cold Steel 1, the first game in Laburl is an introduction to the land. You're moving from point to point, Estelle's reining people into her posse. Posse people. As in a group with a common interest. I know some of you people were thinking something else. And you eventually get your payoff. And what a payoff it is. In terms of why Sky First Chapter ends up so low though, it lies in the first 10 hours of the title. It is quite slow. Now thematically that does make sense because it's not normal for two Greenhorn adventurers to be solving the bigger issues surrounding their country, they have to earn that right. So from that perspective, First Chapter doesn't do anything wrong, it's just a victim of common sense. That being said, from the end of Ruan onwards, the game starts to pick up and once I got to that point I couldn't put it down. But let's get to the tasty stuff. I've mentioned that Sky First Chapter has an amazing payoff, and I'm not exaggerating there. Even to this day, I feel that the reveal of Weissman at the end of First Chapter is the best cliffhanger in the series, something that has become synonymous with the games. It sets things up so well for the sequel because we see how dependent Estelle is on Joshua. Whereas she solves problems for a gung-ho attitude, Joshua is a lot more analytical, and you find that Estelle sort of concedes to that problem-solving ability that her man inherently has. 
So when he leaves her come the end of the game after his reveal as an enforcer, it presents a massive hurdle that she must overcome which we will get into later when we touch on the sequel. For being the first delve into Samuria, I think Trails in the Sky first chapter more than holds its own, it was just doomed to a lower rank because of where it lies chronologically. At number 8, it's the second game in the Cold Steel arc and until very recently my least favourite. It's only after I revisited it about 4 months ago that I appreciated it more. Cold Steel 2, unlike its predecessor, unhooked the shackles and it gave the players the opportunity to explore the land that they had been introduced to from the first game, at least from Act 2 onwards. I've said in my previous video that I had three main issues in Cold Steel 2 during my first playthrough. I felt the Civil War wasn't conveyed as well as it should have been, the epilogue felt tacked on, and the pacing was off. Now I conceded that the pacing was still an issue in this game since you are doing a lot of city hopping aboard the Courageous, whether that be for side quests or for the Cryptids, but it wasn't as prominent an issue as during my first run. As for the other couple of aspects, I was happy that I played the game again because it gave me a better perspective on those two seeming issues. We do see the impact of the war in several instances and it was never the role of Class 7 to be on the front lines. It would defeat the purpose of being a third faction. You can point out that they're pretty much always helping out the Imperial Army during their escapades, but Class 7 was simply there to prevent suffering to the general populace. It just so happens that the nobles are the ones who are inflicting the most suffering. As for the epilogue, which up to that point cemented the game as my least favourite in the series, it's funny how a second playthrough can change an opinion so drastically. I mean sure, if you look at it on the surface, the epilogue means nothing. The final boss in the old schoolhouse literally says that it holds no merit. However, look beyond that and you'll realise that the final hours of Cold Steel 2 are arguably the most important part of the game. With Class 7 splitting up come the end of the semester and Reen being left behind, they needed that one final send-off to get their suppressed melancholy out, to show how important each of them had become to each other. It was moments like this that I was begging for more of in Cold Steel 1, and as a setup for the second half of the Erebonian arc, it lays a solid foundation. At number 7, it's one of the more unique titles in the series and the final instalment of the excellent Sky Arc, Trails in the Sky the Third. The final Sky game shook things up quite significantly. For one thing, the Label crew are not the main players here, we've got a new protag in Kevin Graham who has since revealed his identity as a Grohl's Ritter Dominion. On top of that, instead of the exploration of the world inherent in the previous two games, we have a linear dungeon crawling aspect with a central hub, which immediately can be hit and miss for some players. I don't mind the dungeon crawling aspect too much though, it's not the kind of gameplay I would have chosen, but I feel that the other aspects of the game more than make up for it, especially on the story front. When a person says that Trails in the Sky the Third is not important and you can just go straight into Crossbell or the Erebonia arc, my first response is OBJECTION! First of all, Kevin is a brilliant protagonist. He had one game in the spotlight to show us what he's all about, and by adios this guy is the definition of mentally messed up. I love the relationship between him and Rius, and how through journeying in a world that has literally manifested from the negative emotions tied to his stigma, a reality designed to punish him for the sins that he has committed, he is able to forgive himself for instance that were never down to his own fault. But of course it's not all down to Kevin, as the game also adds in the novel door mechanic, a method by which we can drill into the past or present of certain story arcs. These doors for me are the best part about the game, they add so much more to not only this game, but the future of the series too. I'm certain many of you guys will know of the horrors surrounding Stardor 15 and how it adds so much to Ren's character. This is a good example of what the door's purposes are, to expand on the lore and set us up for the next two arcs. Add on to that a much needed glimpse into the mysterious Septian Church and you've got a game that has a specific purpose in the series. A must play for any Trails fan. At number 6, it's the latest game in the Trail series and what I consider to be a playground of ideas melded into one experience, Hajimari no Kiseki. 
Now don't take that the wrong way when I say a playground of ideas, I mean that Hajimari has a lot of elements thrown into it, as if Falcom are testing the waters for the future of the series. We've got the top-notch story, as you would expect from any Trails title, but you've also got the largest cast of characters yet, along with mini-games, VR, mild gacha systems, episodes, the true reverie corridor, the cross-story mechanic, you know, there's a lot in the cauldron here. And no doubt, many aspects of it work, while others don't really hit the mark. Luckily, the things that do hit are like a perfectly cooked medium rare steak. You are more than aware of them and they are very welcome. Let's start with that cross story element, it's a nice idea and it's executed well. It drills home the idea of Hajimari being an epilogue for this part of the series, an extended farewell for many of the characters. The three routes are enjoyable to play through and though there is a difference in quality between them, at least in my book, I would say they each hold their own. Some of the mini games are quite enjoyable, I actually like the True Reverie Corridor which I thought was going to be my least favourite part of the game, and surprise surprise the best aspect of Hajimari lies in the episodes. They're quite similar to the doors from Sky the Third, and they are a welcome addition to this game, providing either foreshadowing for the future arcs, or giving a little bit extra for the characters we have grown to love during our times in Crossbell and Erebonia. Though I no doubt got a lot of satisfaction out of Hajimari, and I'm very much looking forward to playing it through a second time when it finally gets an English release, I feel its purpose, that being a bridging point in the series, confines it to the middle of the rankings. Coming slap bag in the middle of the 10, it's the first game in the Crossbell arc Zero no Kaseki, or Trails from Zero if you've played the Geofront's patched version. In my opinion, Zero no Kaseki is the best introductory game in the series. It's overall more compelling than Sky First Chapter, and the character roster is stronger than Cold Steel 1. Zero no Kaseki introduces us to one of the finest locations in JRPGs period, that being Crossbell City, which is sandwiched between two superpowers who each have some form of influence in its governance. During that journey, an inexperienced group of detectives from various backgrounds, the SSS, attempts to discover a means by which Crossbell can be freed from the sickness that has plagued it for years. Almost immediately, you're aware of the challenge for the SSS. There is an inherent problem within Crossbell, and it presents a massive barrier that they have to overcome, so the stakes are already high. And slowly but surely, they eat away at the rot surrounding the city, earning the respect from their peers along the way. That's one thing I love about this game, the SSS are not given anything, they have to show they are worthy of trust. They also solve issues that are carried over from the Sky Arc, with one of those being a top moment in the series for me. Add on to that some brilliant pacing, along with a strong payoff in the reveal of the DG cult, and you're on to a winner. Finally, I feel I also have to mention the main villain for this game. No doubt, redemption can be good for an antagonist if it is done correctly, and Falcom are no strangers to that. But on the other side, it is also important to have a representation of pure evil or the completely insane at times, the characters who cannot be redeemed. And luckily, Zero no Kaseki has that aspect covered in Joachim, a man who is the personification of delusion. Someone with no remorse, and as such, is a person who deserves no sympathy when he gets a beatdown. Zero no Kaseki does so much right, and the only reason it ends up midway through the ranking is because there are other games that threw me through a loop even more. At number 4, it's not Trails of Cold Steel 4, even though that would have been quite poetic. No, it's Cold Steel 3. This game, of course, is the first part of the second half of the Erebonia arc, taking place just over one year after the end of Cold Steel 2. Now, you could argue that this game is another introductory title, as it takes on a similar role to Cold Steel 1. You go to school, you do errands, you fight your friends, you go on a school trip, rinse and repeat. But really, that's a disservice to Cold Steel 3 and its wider importance to the series. I see this game as the joining point of all the previous games into the first steps of a finale of a saga. There's no doubt that if you have played the previous seven games, you will get a heck of a lot more enjoyment out of it. And it plants the seed for what you're going to get come Cold Steel 4. But let's not discredit Cold Steel 3, which still has an excellent experience on offer and is arguably the longest one in the series thus far. We get introduced to New Class 7, who in my opinion are just all out better than the original, and a new role for Reen as instructor of this band of youthful misfits, giving him the opportunity to see academic life from the other side. Throughout their journey, they meet up with familiar faces, and eventually it ends with that all-so-sweet cliffhanger. Which is not the best in the series, but is definitely the most brutal. 
Cold Steel 3 doesn't have the best payoff in the series, but it hits you with so many jaw-dropping moments and revelations compared to the other titles, especially from Chapter 4 onwards. The game just goes all out on several occasions during your journey through Western Erebonia, and I dig the growth of New Class 7 during that period. They really feel like a group that supports each other, with a little bit of banter thrown in for good measure. As the joining point for one of the finest finales in any series I've ever played, Cold Steel 3 earns its position at number 4. Right, uh, we're into the top 3, and honestly splitting these final titles apart was nigh on impossible. So I went for a very simple criterion here. Which game mind f***ed me the most? And the one that came out with the bronze medal in that case was Sky's second chapter. For me, the second game in the Sky arc is the best character-driven narrative in the series thus far. It gives us front row seats to the pinnacle of character development in Estelle's journey to find Joshua. First of all, Sky First Chapter sets up this sequel perfectly, not only with the cliffhanger, but with the seeming hopelessness of Estelle's situation, as Joshua was basically the rudder that steered her enthusiasm. She needed him. And any psychologist among my viewers will realise the Kubler-Ross model of grief in full motion come the start of Sky's second chapter. The denial at Grand Cell Castle, the anger at her father, the bargaining with Kevin, the depression when she finally returns home, and of course the acceptance that she now has to bring him back by becoming stronger and earning that moment to once again see him. What follows is one of the most compelling adventures in the series, where we learn about Ouroboros and their wider plan, we see the existence of one of the fabled Septarian, the redemption of Alan Richard, the reveal of Kevin as a Grals Ritter Dominion, and of course, that scene after the escape from the Glorious, which demonstrates fully the growth of Estelle, and that she has more than earned the right to bring Joshua back at this moment. But of course, it's not all about Estelle. We cannot forget about the growing relationship between Tita and Agate, the wily mind of Olivier on full display, the story of Ren, and the clash of ideals between Joshua and Luve atop the Axis pillar. There are just so many noteworthy highlights to love about this game, and I feel those moments stem from the amazing characters we have in the Sky Arc, as without them, these scenes would not hit as strongly as they do. And that's why I consider Sky's second chapter to be the finest character-driven narrative in Trails thus far. Whereas Sky's second chapter is the best from a characterization standpoint, Cold Steel 4 is just amazing for the sheer amount of epic moments that stem from it. Being the culmination of nine games worth of content, it goes out with a bang and doesn't pull any punches. I have actually got emotional several times from this game, which is saying something because very few forms of media have had that effect on me. Now you can say that the game relies on that nostalgia factor, bringing in familiar faces from the previous arcs, and a lot of enjoyment comes from that aspect. And I agree, the fact that Cold Steel 4 plays on interconnectivity, arguably the most unique facet of the series in the first place, is a big reason why I adore the game. But that's not to say that Cold Steel 4 can't stand on its own. Firstly, it's no secret to many of my frequent viewers that I'm a big fan of the Divine Knights. I feel that they give the Cold Steel narrative the unique spin that sets it apart from the other arcs. I mean, I even did a story video on them last week if that's not evidence enough. And they pretty much take centre stage in this game, with one of them being the main antagonist of many events that have happened over the course of the previous eight titles. Now, talking about the antagonist, or at least what stems from him, the curse is hit and miss, admittedly for players, but it's a big hit for me. To really drill home the scale of what Cold Steel 4 is trying to deliver on, it needed something like the curse to make it happen, and I think it fits the mould of the epic tale that the Cold Steel arc was going for. And of course, it lends massively to the redemption of arguably the greatest villain this series has seen, or likely will ever see. The story of Osborne is amazing, a guy who has been mentioned in passing since all the way back in Sky's second chapter, and when you realise the darkness that has surrounded him for years and how he was able to resist it to steer this one opportunity for the heroes of Erebonia to rid the land of its ancient curse, it really is awesome to have that realisation that he was willing to become the enemy of the world to make it happen, and that he had that will of iron to see it through. But naturally, what cemented Cold Steel 4 in my personal top 2 was that beautiful ending, the best finale I have ever experienced in a game. The music, the emotion behind it, the relief, it was all perfect. It was the send-off I wanted for the end of Cold Steel, and it will likely remain in my memory all the way to the end of this series. A truly special game.
I'm of the opinion that no game is infallible, but god damn it, this game comes very close to that accolade. My personal favourite game in the Trails series and one of my favourite titles of all time is Al no Kaseki, or Trails to Azure in English. Take all the good stuff from Zero no Kaseki and dial it up a notch or two, because that is what the sequel is all about. Al no Kaseki is just peak Falcom, a story that grabbed me by the augments and didn't let go all the way to the end. The pacing was masterful, there was always something going on, you could never shake the feeling that something was amiss at any given moment. The location and crossbell took on another dimension with the addition of the West Sumeria Trade Conference and especially became all that's more intimidating when you had the exposure to the other nations especially Osborne and Erebonia. The fantasy element was ramped up with the Azure Zero project, the suspense and atmosphere was consistently putting you on edge. Really, I can't come up with more superlatives for the game. The only real drawbacks I have from Al are in the case of some of the villains, those being Mariabal and Ian as I could see them coming from a mile away, but it was balanced out with the betrayal of Arios and Dieter Kreuz, who I feel were excellent antagonists for the game. The other issue, and definitely the more pressing for me, were the final bonding events atop the Macabre, because some of those characters had their whole story locked behind it, which is a big no-no for me. You can't hide important narrative behind an optional event in a game like this. But that is it. The rest of the game is just pure Trails goodness. The characters, the sprinklings of interconnectivity, the revelations, it's just amazing. And how can I forget the finest moment in the series, the reveal of the alternate timeline at the end of Owl, something that has the potential of becoming one of the most important aspects of the Trails series going forward. The fact that the opening scene of Zero ends in the deaths of the SSS and the start of your journey aboard that train as Kia uses her power to reset the timeline back to Zero so you can survive in this alternate reality is something that I will never forget, even long after the end of the series. And it's only natural for me that the game with the finest moment in Trails ends at the pinnacle of my list. And that is it guys, my ranking of the Trails games up to this point, and now with Kuro no Kiseki on the horizon we're moving into Uncharted territory, a fresh start for the series that will hopefully see it progress to even greater heights. Enjoy your weekend guys, peace.